Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, writing comics, drawing comics, uh, promoting and marketing our comics, and the lifestyle of the cartoonists and all the things that surround this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. And we're going to talk about games today. Games? Games don't have anything to do with comics? Yes, they do. Uh, and I've got two really, really smart people here to talk with me about it. I'm going to start with Eli Nyberger of AEDL.org. How's it going, Jersey? Hey, Eli, you haven't been on the show in forever. I know. It's scandalous. <laughs> I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> I am super excited about this because uh, between the two of us, we can usually keep a, a conversation running. <laughs> but, uh, Understatement. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just sit back and let the two of you go. It's great. And that other guy who's going to have a hard time getting a word in edgewise is <laughs> Dave Carter of hey, uh, University of Michigan. Uh, uh, what is it? The computer and video game library. Computer game archive. Yes. Archive. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. Uh, celebrating the yeah. Fifth so year. this this week is the fifth anniversary of the computer and video game archive. Hard to believe. And so we're having all kinds of stuff. We had a um, last night. We had a, uh, a panel discussion of U of M faculty who used games in teaching and research. And soon that will be streaming online on the library's website. And I'll let people know where to where to find that. You can um, follow me at Dave's Read Comment. Dave reads comics on the Twitterverse, and and or uh, UMCVGA is the Twitter feed for the Computer Video Game Archive. Oh, I didn't know I had a feed. Yes, oh, we cool. do. Yeah. So okay, well, wh while we're on that, if Matt can pull up the uh, the pictures of the uh, CVGA, we can talk about what this thing is. We've hinted, we've danced around it before. Uh, yeah, like, when I've been on, you said, "Hey, there's this there's this thing that Dave does with games, <laughs> but let's talk comics." So. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, there's an archive of video games. I just saw a, a Virtual Boy. Yeah, so, so right now he's showing that a... that panning lovingly over yeah. a Vectrex. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jersey said, you should bring some cool stuff. And I said, so I bring some of the really cool stuff. It's either too heavy or it's too fragile. So he, so he said, take pictures. So we got some pictures here. Um, so Matt, I guess, is scanning over right now. Uh, what what are we? Look he keeps going too fast. I well, we just just describe the, the the archive right, itself right. while we look at the pictures. So the computer video game archive is on the north campus in the Duderstadt Center here in lovely Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and uh, we have over five thousand games available, more than sixty different systems. We have consoles, handhelds, microcomputers, and I call them microcomputers because that's what we used to call them in the old days. That's right. Your Apple II, your Commodore sixty four, your Vic twenty, all that fun kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so we're open to the public. You can come in. You can play the games. Um, I can play the games. You can play the games. We say that we're not just preserving games. We're preserving the gaming experience. Ah. So we want you to be able to have the original equipment, the original displays, you know, the CRTs with the curved screens or the monochrome monitors. Oh, and Apple II GS. And stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> Got from my bar mitzvah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we had uh, last week somebody donated to, to us a Mac Plus which is the machine I had when I was in college. And, um, and I played many, many a game on that. Um, and I wrote papers. It's okay, Mom. I <laughs> <laughs> but man, uh, Crystal Quest or uh, Might and Magic 2 and all that stuff. Uh, spent many, many Bolo, an hour. Bolo, probably. Pardon? Pardon? Bolo? Did you play Bolo? I don't know. If I, I, I must was, have. That was my major problem with Macs in the okay. early days. of uh, yeah. Tetris. Uh, was, was, I played Tetris on that Mac and just my three-finger and... Thumb on the thumb on the space bar, and man, I could go for uh, hours just yeah. playing Tetris, and just um, I'm sure my my finger problems to this day <laughs> stem from the <laughs> purple tunnel from playing way too many games. So this is cool. This is a place where you can go. Like, well, I I don't go to the University of Michigan, uh, so I guess if I went there to say I need to play in television again after all these years, you'd be like, no, out. No, we will let you in as long what? as as long as you have a photo ID that we can confiscate while you're playing the games. Yeah. We'll give it back to you when you're done. Uh, you're welcome to come in. Uh, we're open uh, Monday through Saturday till 9 p.m. Uh -huh. um, and so, and earlier than anybody in the right minds would get there. So don't <laughs> 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 it's actually noon on Mondays, 10 a.m. Tuesday through Friday, and 1 p.m. on Saturdays. Are there people open. in there at 10 a.m.? Uh, there's occasally people who drop. Who so that's the sweet in. time to come if you want. Yeah, if you, you know. if you want your pick of anything, I yeah. would say 10 a.m. on a Tuesday is yeah. perfect time. If you want a crowded room. 
where are your your elbow to elbow with people playing Smash Brothers? That would be a Friday evening starting at about <laughs> 4 p.m. Very very cool. So there's there's reason enough to come to Ann Arbor. But uh, is the is the ADL doing anything with? Well, ADL does a few things with games. There's gaming oh, tournaments yeah. here. We've actually we uh, in December of 2014 we will celebrate the 10th anniversary of our first game tournament wow. at ADL, wow. which is crazy. It's hard to even imagine. But then I look at some of the kids who were you know eighth grade in the first one and they're married and you know it's, it's, <laughs> it's a very very different experience but um, we also have recently received an anonymous donation of a bunch of classic games and we are combing through them and we will be filling the CVGA's holes with things that are that are missing from their Excellent. collection that we have in ours and it is a collection solely for use at events it won't be circulating it'll just be used at library gaming events and you know the classic stuff really still delivers people still want to come have those classic gaming experiences especially on the vintage hardware you know there's a powerful sense of nostalgia for people of our age who who grew up in such uh, uh, memory restrained times uh, <laughs> but then there's also the parents who want their kids to have those experiences and see what it was like and in many you know there isn't really an equivalent of that for prior generations you know the closest thing is like watching reruns that you were important to your parents which is the most boring thing ever you know it's like <laughs> it's like the shows you know to think about the, the, the equivalent for our generation I, it always mystifies me that the, the, the IP and the properties that were most important to me growing up are also extremely important to my kid, who's a generation, you know, a generation behind Star Wars, Mario, you know, even Pac-Man, whereas the media of, that my dad was into could not be less relevant. You know, it's yeah. like howdy doody in that. That, that, that is a weird, that, that is one thing where the cyclical nature of the generations has changed in, this, in recent times. Like the story I love to tell is when I was at a Comic-Con and a kid asked me to draw a Cobra Commander. <laughs> and, and it was right when G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra was coming right, out. Right. So I was like, oh, I better look up a picture of that new goofy, you know, <laughs> Darth Vader Cobra Commander. And I start sketching. He's like, no, 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 no. Draw the real one, the real one. I'm OG, like, well, OG Cobra yeah, Commander. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, what are you talking Talking about, he's like, he's got a silver mask and a blue helmet. I'm like, you're talking about the '80s one. He's like, you gave yeah. him a hug right then. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I was like, well, how do you know? I mean, your dad, your dad, and he's like, no, YouTube. You know, so yeah, like these right. kids are exposed to all this stuff, and they're not aware of the, yeah. the context of it. So it, it's it's really fascinating. My kid's favorite thing to watch on YouTube is a Super Mario Brothers Super Show. You know, with Captain Lou Albano <laughs> right. from the 80s. It was such tele terrible television. And like, well, and you know, the guest star, star Sergeant Slaughter was a guest star on that show. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see Had how that media Had a catchy theme song. Up. Oh, yeah. With, with that, that faux rap for that's the Mario right. Brothers and Plumbing's a game. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So if we're going to talk more about what both you guys are doing in your respective fields, uh, talking about, you, you use the word experience, and I want to harken back to Comics Are Great episode 29, uh, one that Eli was on. Uh, the title was Just Be Interesting, comicsaregreat.com slash CAG29, where we talked about one of the things that uh, a key value an artist has, uh, or any kind of you know uh, personality maker, is uh, leveraging a unique experience, right? As as more and more media becomes uh, turned into, like, I think that well, you can frame commodified. It, I'd say commodified. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You said the bits have no inherent value, That's right? right? Yeah. And it's infinitely repeatable. So what is the thing you can do? You can create a unique experience, and this is something you've done at the library for gosh, past. You know, like you said, a decade. Yeah. We should say also that you wrote a book about this too. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it's mostly it's a book for library people to get a clue about video game tournaments. Yeah. But you know, I mean, and, it, and the the reason, you know, I used to get the question, what do kids learn at a video game tournament at the library? My answer was always, well, they learn that, that the library gives a shit about what they're into. Yeah. You know, and it's really that's critical. It's it's the library has always been the interest of their community. Mm -hmm. and providing unique experience and increasing it used to be that getting your hands on a book was a unique experience <laughs> right and now those books are literally passing through our heads at this <laughs> <Yeah>. very moment <laughs> encoded in spread spectrum you know so it, you, we need to find something new something that you can't get anywhere else and i think that's that's a big part of the value of the cvga is that you can't get that stuff anywhere else even playing it in emulation it's not the same i was going to say yeah cuz uh, the internet archive recently announced that they're putting a whole bunch of atari oh, games yeah. Yeah. right jsms is the the project is javascript emulator amazing project and and 
very exciting. Very exciting. I can play E.T. all I want, right? And the for so five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a patched version. Someone actually fixed the bugs in E.T. and so you could actually win it. Oh, okay, that's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, but no, the, the archivist that's of that's their Han like, shot first. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but my first thought was like, awesome! I could play all the Atari games. I've, I've got like a couple hundred at home, but you know, it, it's uh, it's it's interesting to think like all the gonna play Taz as often as I want. <laughs> but then I think like it's not gonna be the same without that right? rubbery, yeah. half broken joystick and that orange button that doesn't work half the time. If I'm doing the keyboard thing, it's not gonna be quite the same. Yeah. Yeah. I've I found that with, with a lot of these old game systems, you're like, why didn't that system take off? What was wrong with it? And when I've used them, ergonomics. So many times the controller was uncomfortable to hold, or the Virtual Boy. Mm. If, if besides the technology not quite being there, the way you had to sit there with your head sort of haunched <laughs> over and the screen like that. Five minutes of that thing, and you're like, oh my. And yeah. I, part of that's probably because I'm 40, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I'm sure that wasn't good for kids either. And. Um, I, th I, I remember when it demoed in the stores, and I was excited. I was a teenager when it first came out, and I was like, "All right, I gotta see this." And then I played like about two, three minutes with the store demo. I was like, "This is not, not you not, know, you know, conducive to a fun time." Right, but, right. So yeah, and, uh, games were you know different back in the old days when um, when the goal was to get you to part with your quarters. You know, you'd go into the arcade. The game was designed to be a short and finite experience for you. Yeah. Uh, it's very different from today's Xbox games where you're shelling out 60 bucks at a sure. pop and you're expecting 20, 30, 40, 50 hours worth of experience f for your money. Um, so that's, a, that's where I think a lot of that sort of changeover, when it went from the arcades to the home, um, it's sort of a, a change in, in how games are marketed, how they were designed, and what the experience was designed to be. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in a three-minute three to five minute experience you can kind of tell a story if you're really sort of good but you got to get the action in there in the games you know what was the story behind centipede heck if i know i was shooting <laughs> i was shooting at bugs and mushrooms yeah mushrooms were involved yeah right? so that was the nickelodeon days <laughs> yeah. right? or, or or tempest or or something like that and um and so now so like is the is the par uh, the parallel that I and mean, this is going to sound all npr and trite but uh, the, the, the arcade you got the corduroy jacket for it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll try to throw it in a low tone. Uh, uh, is, uh, the, the old arcades were the Nickelodeon days, and now video games are approaching more like cinema, right? Going from like the, the, the penny arcade where yeah, you turn right, the thing right. and you watch the guy run on a horse. He's running on, on a horse! horse. Yeah. Right. Isn't that awesome? Uh, <laughs> now we're actually getting like yeah. cinema. We had, we had a group of guys come in a few years ago, and they wanted they were waiting to get on one of the Xboxes. And they're like, do you guys have Pong? I'm like, yeah, we got Pong. We can set it up for you. So we set up Pong. They're sitting there. You know, three to five minutes later, they're like, what else do you have? <laughs> right. So yeah, do, totally. you mean you've explored the depths of the character in, in Pong? You know what's going on and all the thing? They're like, yeah. Well, we would spend hours sitting there with our Pong machine, our Sears Telestar right. system, whatever, yep. hooked up to the TV in the living room and just watching that little book go back and forth and hitting it, you know, with our paddle sort of thing. You like were making that. things move on the TV. Yeah, right? that, that, was, that was like. I'm controlling novelty. the television. Yeah, there was the novelty yeah. of it. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to I want to round back on this idea of experience and all this stuff that you were just talking about here. I think ties into this idea of like uh, what storytellers need to think about as things mature and evolve. Uh, but okay, so just to just to put on paper that you guys have have thought really hard about this stuff. Yeah, you got unique, hard to find video game collections at the CVGA. ADL, holy moly, I was going down the list, and I was like, well, I can't talk about all this stuff, but like the summer game, we're going to talk about that a little bit. The Lego contests, which yeah. blew up in the last five yeah, years. Yeah, it's really right? become so huge and, and fantastic. And you know, part of the unique experience now is you bring a creative work into that, cre into that experience. Yes, you know? yeah. Because uh, you know, to build with Legos is not a unique experience. To have your Lego creation judged by professionals and found to be valued and at our lego contest it's not one of those everyone gets a trophy kind of things we recognize excellence and the kids know that that matters you know and it's it's a fantastic experience for them and as a library person what i love about it is that it's establishing in these you know uh, malleable young minds that the library is where your creative works get valued you know, that it's like the library is the place where your creative works can reach a larger audience and be recognized for excellence. Well, I'm doing this show right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Case in point. Yeah. Uh, I, I, man, I want to just jump right into that real quick. This, you bring a creative work into the experience. So this is one of the things that I've been crunching on as I'm looking at. Um, 
as we look at games, the, you could go down the literal interpretation of experience around fiction by talking about transmedia. I'd like to bypass that a little bit because that is an interesting topic. But what I want to talk about is because like when I think about transmedia, like like there was that one law book that came out. Did you guys hear about this? Mm -hmm. Author puts out a book. It's like this uh, dystopian future with Wizard of Oz kind of thing. But then he builds like apps and games on okay. the website. And then there's like this app you can put on your phone where you can like lift it up. And you can find secret things in the real world that tie into the. So it's like this whole transmedia world thing. That that's interesting, and that creates a sense of immersion and participation in the world that you build. But I'm here to advocate for the independent cartoonist who doesn't have those kind of resources, sure. doesn't necessarily have a programmer friend that they can uh, uh, call on for that. So when we talk about experiences, I want to talk about like what can like the independent person do. And one of the things that uh, I was caught off guard by was you heard about this game called Animal Crossing? <laughs> How oh could you not God. hear about this game called Animal Crossing? <laughs> Holy smokes. They yeah. eat in our house. At least until Pokemon X and Y came out, Animal Crossing was the big thing. Oh, yeah. really? Okay, so like the, the kids are... The people I'm hearing about is the 20-somethings, yeah. like 25, 27-year-olds who, like, when this game came out, they waited in line. Well, it's because they can't afford real estate in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> they think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. <laughs> yeah. You you're... mean it's not going to be a cute green owl who has me sign my uh, mortgage paper? Paperwork. Oh, no, that sucks. No, 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 no. It's your hot water heater. It's going to get three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. Yeah. Uh, Simulating the experience of home ownership for a generation that may never achieve it. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that, that That's That is a so grim dark. but accurate <laughs> assessment. Uh, unfortunately, yes. But, okay, so the game comes out, and then, like, my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed was just filled with Animal Crossing fan art, mm -hmm. screen grabs. And all these people are talking about this stuff. They're, they're talking like crazy about Animal Crossing. Like it consumed their lives. And for whatever reason, they felt compelled to share it with all of their friends, right? Uh, and to the point where, you know, some, some of my other friends were like, Animal Crossing tweets for crying out loud, you know? Uh, and I was talking with Matt, Matt Dubay, our uh, technical producer of the show, and I was like, well, what was that for you? He's like, GoldenEye when I was a kid. It's like GoldenEye, we all, you know, it was the social experience of uh, we, we had to play against each other. And I think about when I was a kid, it was Life Force, uh, the Nintendo game where, you know, it was a thing every Wednesday afternoon after we go to the comic store, go to a friend's house, and we all sat together and played Life Force, did the Konami codes, so we'd have infinite guys and whatever. <laughs> uh, but I'm trying to figure out, like, what... What do games do that encourage this kind of social sharing and, and bringing your own creativity to it, like you were talking about at the library, right. so that it becomes like a social participatory event? And what can authors learn from that? What do games do? I like, think part of it is that uh, this isn't unique to games, but every creative work is a community, right? A creative work is a community of people who love it. Right? And sometimes it's a really small community. You can't make a living. Sometimes it's a really big community, and it's all over the world. Um, and I think that what specifically Animal Crossing has done so well is that they blur the line between the community of players and your community of friends. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, you say, what is the reason that people are tweeting about it? It's because Isabel asks them to. Isabel is a little poodle who lives in the, uh, in the bank in Animal Crossing, and she is on Twitter, completely outside the game itself. And she's out there on Twitter, and of course, everyone who's playing the game is following Isabel. And she says, <laughs> hey, guys, there's a new couch. Who's got it? Tweet a picture of it. And you don't want to let her down because she's so nice, and she's such a helpful figure in this world that you cherish. And it's like they really cracked the code of how to take the community of the game and spread it around the other communities. Because then people post a tweet, and it's like all their friends who aren't, see who aren't playing the game follow it. But then it works. Like, for example, uh, my daughter decided to pursue getting the mermaid set of furniture, which uh, is, is an Animal Crossing, because I showed her a picture that Natasha Allegri, character designer from uh, Adventure Time, creator of Fiona and Cake and Bee and Puppycat, mm -hmm. uh, Natasha Allegri tweeted a picture of her house all done up in the mermaid set, and I showed it to my daughter, and she was like, oh my god, I have to have that. Oh, and so wow. she started working on raising the necessary funds and making the necessary social connections with the non-player characters in the game to be able to assemble the whole mermaid set of furniture. And all of that incentivization happened outside the game world. You know, and that's not built into the game. You can't tweet from right inside the game. You know, so it's, they realize that the game is a community that is beyond the game itself and they embrace it. It's not like Steam where it's all locked up inside Steam. Mm. You know, it's on the greater world. It's part of people's regular lives. It's a, they, they operate in the commons. Yeah. It, Twitter's not exactly a commons. It's a weird commons, but, but right. it's, it's accepted as a commons, right? Uh, so 
I'm thinking about the the cartoonist who's making a thing and posting a thing, and maybe they've got like Twitter followers and stuff. What can they do that that borrows from this idea of uh, interacting with the community? I mean, I guess like making their own fictional characters talk like that. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I mean that's something to think. About. I mean, I'm assuming that most cartoonists who at least are listening to this podcast yeah. um, probably have their own Twitter feed, but but. Like you said, how many of their characters have their own Twitter feeds? And how well, many... I mean, Chris Onstad did that big time back in the early days of Akewood, where each one of his characters had their own blog. And that was mostly, that was a big way that he stretched out the time between updates, because he's never been a big updater, which yeah. I, I, I don't have a problem with at all. But he, those characters had their own blogs in character. And, you know, some of his characters are real assholes. <laughs> and it's it's very entertaining to read what's going on in their lives between strips. Yeah. And sure, it's a commitment. But it is a way that he took the community of his audience outside the box that he creates. And, and I think that every creator probably has backstory and stuff like that on the characters that they're not, that they shouldn't actually be squeezing into the final product. Because you, uh, you should develop that stuff, but you shouldn't necessarily put it all in the product. Otherwise, you're Neil Stevenson and your books are a thousand pages long. Um, so, <laughs> so you should, but you've got all this background material and things like that that you could be drawing on in social media and in other, in other places um, to sort of share that along with it for the, for the people who are like really into it, who want to know more and, and can be enticed into, into knowing more. And, because you're you're headed towards that thousand true fans sort of sort of right. ideal for it. Well, I think the other piece of it is that the uh, the people. Uh, well, the, probably the best example is John Rosenberg in his comic uh, scenes from a multiverse, mm -hmm. uh, which you know he used to do goats. It was a big long epic story. He's actually coming back to that. But scenes from multiverse when he first started doing it, he'd run four strips during the week, and then his audience would vote on which one got to came, come back for the fifth day. I mean, and it was like, that was a really great way to engage with his audience. And then it, and it went very well until he got to the point that he was like not liking the choices they were making. <laughs> and, you know, but he's such a great creator. And still, sometimes he'll throw out questions of a story problem he's working on. Uh, and then you, people will see their, their ideas show up in his strip. So he's forming an interactive relationship with his audience. And I know we've talked on this show before about, well, what about the people who just want to do the comic and they don't want to be a mark? Well, you know, you can't find an author of a book anymore who isn't expected to do their own marketing and do their own outreach and have their own community. It's, ju it's just there aren't the people willing to spend money to do that for you right. anymore. So right. if you want to build your audience, you got to put in the work. Uh, the next episode of the show, we're going to talk a lot about uh, where to share your stuff. And I'm bringing on some young people to talk about Tumblr and how it works and everything. Because one of the pieces of advice that I... I Are you saying the... we're too old for Tumblr? Is that what's Absolutely happening not. Yeah. Absolutely not. I, <laughs> I just want to get uh, a 20-year-old's perspective okay. on, on what's interesting about it. Uh, but but one of the pieces of advice that I got, or like the, some common wisdom that's getting passed around in the publishing world, is if you're pitching a book, they want to see that you have a Tumblr and that there are lots of reshares. Like, it doesn't matter how many followers you have. It matters how many reshares you have. Uh, and, and it's interesting to me that they're that savvy about it now, right? That they're paying attention to um, what's your reach and not just in terms of follower count, but in terms of network uh, activity on your site. So, uh, yeah, But let's not miss that now the publisher is saying, what audience are you bringing us? Right. Not what audience are we bringing you? Yeah, and that is a complete reversal of the role of publishing. Yeah, that is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know that. So, so your next question is, publisher, what, you, what the heck are you doing for me? <laughs> Good question. Right, right. It, it, well, it strengthens the argument for if you've got the network effect, just leverage it in your own way, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, just today, Ben Hatke, uh, guest at Kids Read Comics this past summer, uh, the author of Z to the Space Girl, fantastic graphic novel, just posted a YouTube video where one of his fans did a cereal commercial of uh, she's eating boring cereals as Brand X, and all of a sudden Z to the Space Girl appears in her kitchen and, or her dining room and says, like, I'm going to make your cereal exciting, and she zaps the box and turns into Z to the Space Girl cereal. He didn't solicit this, you know, but... He honored it. The moment it was made, he was like, look at this thing that my fan made for me. Uh, so th the idea of like honoring the creative works that your readers bring to you, right? And beyond fan art, but like encouraging, and, encouraging through honoring uh, readers' participation in your thing, right? Is that Well, yeah, and I'd love, I mean, all the cosplay that he tweets of people, you know, that are dressed up as Zeta. And it's like, yeah. it really gives you a feel 
Well, you know, even if you don't know any of those people, it helps you feel that you as a Zeta reader are a part of a community of Zeta readers. And it's not just little girls that are in the Zeta reader yeah. audience. It's, it's grown-ups. It's all kinds of people. And I think that that is increasingly on the creator to connect their audience who may only have a connection with them in common, find a way to connect them with each other by sharing the things that they share with, with the creator. When, when I have these discussions with other creators, sometimes the, the argument will be leveled at me that, well, games are totally a different thing because you are interacting, you're participating within the game. You are Spider-Man. You're not reading about Spider-Man. Com uh, literature, comics, prose are a more passive experience because it's the author telling you. Uh, but how does, that, how does that change when we give the readers a sense of ownership of the experience, right? Like, that's the thing that, that I think is what we're trying what we're describing how how literature is converging more on games and not just in gamification and tricking people to interact with your thing more right but but like in a real like the like you guys are describing a situation where the fiction itself isn't just coming purely f sprung from the mind of the, the author and i don't think it ever did i think that's just a story we like to tell yeah, right? I, I think kids these days <laughs> <laughs> so, sort of expect a certain level of interaction with the entertainment they're consuming mm -hmm. uh, whether it's their whether it's their tweeting about pretty little liars or writing fan fiction ab about certain things or cosplaying or whatever with their stuff and games i think are, are one of the things that sort of driven them to that sort of because they, they've been playing games all their life in in games where there's a story all their life. I mean, yeah. I've been playing games since, you know, I was seven or, or whatever, but it was, you know, it was Space Invaders and Missile Command and that sort of stuff where the, the depth of the story is really, really shallow. <laughs> 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 um, whereas today, the, they're expecting to interact with their entertainment. And if, and if you don't allow for that in some way, if, uh, if you don't, in, I don't know how much you have to encourage it or, or just tolerate it or, or whatever. It's probably going to depend on the creator and the nature, nature of the thing, whatever. Um, but, you know, now that Amazon just started their um, thing where they're publishing fan fiction. Oh, like yeah. Like yeah. official fan fiction yep. that people are publishing. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that would just be unheard of like 10 years, 10 years ago. It's like, what? That's our intellectual property. How dare you try to do anything with it and try to make money off it? Another thing, we could make money off of it <laughs> <laughs> and encourage people to engage in, in, and stuff like that and in, into things. So um, the engagement is going to happen um, if you're lucky. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, that's the trick. Um, and uh, engagement is a sign of good. You know, pe people, people doing fan art about your things, people dressing up as your characters and all that sort of stuff, that's a sign that they like it and they want to share the fact that they like it and they're excited about it and they're willing to invest their time into telling other people how much they like your work. And so you, can't, you can't buy that sort of promotion. No, and the trick is, is how do you create that engaging experience? So this leads me to my next thing. I want to talk about uh, a fun topic, uh, that moment, that game, that game that changed us, and we were <laughs> rocked to the core, we were all a quiver, and n nothing is ever the same after this, and I'm going to spend the next X amount of hours of my life on this game. And, it, and to do where it's the kind of experience where you talked about nostalgia earlier, right? Uh, when you go back to it again, it's like, oh, Billy Idol's playing in the background. I smell Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> there's no Billy Idol in the room. There's no Cheetos, but I'm back in that moment, right? Uh, and I brought uh, some of mine. I brought Shaq Fu was one of them. But, <laughs> but also, I mean, we can talk about design, too. Boy, combat. Look at the graphic design going on. <laughs> you know well, what? that's the Sears version. <laughs> is that what this is? Yeah, isn't no, it? I don't think so. No? No, I'll see you turn. No, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, but like they weren't, <laughs> they weren't really trying to sell us on it. It's like they. Well, what's this? The cartridge. Jersey. Yeah, um, yeah. If, if you the look at the half, the narrative is in the box, box art. art. Yeah, because right. they, they would not show you screenshots from the game to to advertise the game. That's right. They had they had professional artists coming in and drawing stuff, which was what you were supposed to imagine in your mind was actually happening when you were watching the four bit pixels roaming right. around on the screen. <laughs> That's true. I, the only one I ever saw like in the Sears wish book was ColecoVision had an actual screen cap of uh, Donkey Kong because yeah. they were really touting like how much better their graphics were. How's they got the exclusive license? Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. were talking about how much it looked like the arcade version. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, you didn't often see screen grabs on it. Uh, I also have a uh, Kool-Aid Man versus the Thirsty. Oh, yes. man. <laughs> Don't tell Anne that I, this is her game. She would kill me six times if she found out that I took it out of the house. <laughs> it's one of her cherished relics. But, uh, but yeah, 
this is one of those ones that when she was a kid, it was like, oh man, Kool Aid Man, I got to play some more Kool Aid Man. So <laughs> while I was vamping there, what what can you guys think of? What was one? I I mean, I was a centipede player when I was. Uh, that was sort of my game when I was in uh, junior high, high school, whenever, whenever it was that came out. If, if the arcade had Centipede, I would you know, throw my quarters into that. I played plenty of other stuff, too. Uh -huh. Tempest was a favorite. The Star Wars game. Oh man, yeah. where you sat, where you sat down. Re oh, the sitting one, sitting the sitting Star Wars game with the vector graphics and all like that, and Obi Wan Kenobi talking up o from, from over your shoulder, over your shoulder. You. Oh nice. man, that that was an engaging, enveloping experience. Probably one of the first ones I remember having in an arcade, where where you felt like you were part of the game, and not just play, not just. Playing it was the one game. of the first ones with a soundtrack too, wasn't it? I mean. It was the first one where it was a soundtrack that you already knew. Right. Okay. You know, where, I mean, it sounded like the orchestral music, and of course it was all so burned into our brains, you yeah, know, right. and it was like, it didn't have to really be an orchestra it because it had the same, you know, uh, hypnagogic effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm just thinking, like, like Centipede, not much. Like, you have sound effects. Right, like, right, right, right. Right, and, like, I think it's, like, Dig Dug and ones like that yeah. where it has, like, a little fanfare at the beginning, but then it's pretty much just, like, the noise that he makes when he digs. Right, right? but there wasn't a, there wasn't sound uh, music running throughout the undercurrent of the, of the game. Uh, like, Ms. Pac-Man would have the little... Right, and cut scenes. Cut, cut scenes. Oh, proto cut scenes. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> and there'd be music at the start. You did it, Then waka 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 whoop waka waka waka. So, because they just didn't have the computing power to have music playing and the sound effects from the game playing. You know, right. pick pick one, and you needed <laughs> you needed the 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 audio feedback in order to play. Well, and game. really, I think what you're talking about here is the jump between the eight bit era and the sixteen bit era of arcade games, because. Um, while I'm not sure about Atari, I know the one that I remember for having a, a memorable soundtrack is Marble Madness, which was one of the yeah. first 16-bit arcade games, and it was, you know, it had stereo sound, and that was, you know, unheard of at that time. <laughs> but you know, when I think about my, you know, most cherished gaming experiences, you know, I had an Apple II Plus in the house, and uh, you know, there were a lot of really weird things that my uncle sent me on the back of floppies with a hole punched in it, you know, and oh, all that yeah. stuff. Um, but I, the thing that I keep going back to is Zelda. Um, and I remember very clearly my mom saying to someone else's mom, it's like, hey, do you have the new babysitter? It's like, who's the new babysitter? You know, Zelda? <laughs> you know, it is, it's like something that your children could silently consume for hours on end. Yeah. And most importantly, how much knowledge was required to succeed in Zelda that was not inside the game world? Like, how could you find the, the, the one tombstone you had to move? You had to talk to your friends and see who knew right. where it had been moved and maybe call the Nintendo helpline if you got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when they used, they used yeah. to have a, a call center that you could call in to get stuck in a game. Can you imagine? Was it $2 was a minute? One? No, no, no. It, it was, was, it was not, a t it was just a long distance call. Oh, this was wow. before 900 numbers. Oh, you know? wow. So it wasn't toll free, yeah. but yeah, I mean that was its own whole thing. And then the Nintendo, the early Nintendo Power newsletter that was just like a two eight and a half by eleven pages, and they would release clues in that to the stuff that people were really stuck on. But the big thing of why Zelda was transformative and what the feature was that changed everything is the first game you could save on a ho on uh, a home console. You know, yeah. on a computer, of course, you could. There were some games that supported game saves, yeah. but on a console, it was the first game that had state that persisted after you turned it off. So it wasn't like save a code like in Metroid. No, was... I mean that was a little bit before that, but you know because yeah. it was there was a battery in the cartridge it was more expensive. Uh, but you know, I mean the the Metroid codes and the Kid Icarus codes yeah. were, you know, source of constant pain and anguish right. for all children <laughs> it, yeah, it was like 30 characters. <laughs> well, and also they didn't distinguish between uppercase L, lowercase L and I and zero and O and it's like if you made one mistake, uh, you're screwed, you know. Well, and then you just use the Justin Bailey Right. Uh, Icarus fights Medusa angels. That was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was one of the for codes? kid Icarus that gets you the fully armed. Yeah. Oh, cool. And then I'm it was not just... sure what important information has been lost to make room for that. You know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so here's here's my question for you. You're playing Zelda, and you're like, I don't know where how to move, how to find this thing, and oh, you just move the tombstone. You got to talk to your friends. What was it about that experience that made it so that it wasn't aggravating to not know? Uh, granted, we were kids. And kids, perhaps, or maybe we were a little bit more patient. I don't know. But I think about that now. Like, so what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing on behalf of you know independent comic creators, like, oh, make it intentionally a little difficult to get to things that you want in my story, uh, or how do you make it a treasure hunt? Okay, this this gets back to something that when you were asking about uh, 
you know, kind of the difference between games and comics. And what it, what it made me think is that really, it's a, there's the three main pieces of games, and it's puzzle, skill, and narrative. Right, you know, so there's puzzles you have to solve. There's skills you have to develop, like jumping puzzles and you know stuff like that. And then there's the narrative. And it used to be that games hardly had any narrative. Now games are intensely narrative. And I think really the biggest difference between games and comics within narrative is that the game makes you work harder to discover the narrative. Think how hard you have to work to see every bit of narrative in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. You know, or uh, you know, it, it just. I don't know if we're going to talk about the map thing. I hope we get to yeah, the map Yeah, we'll thing. get to that. <laughs> but think about Bioshock, where you are dropped into the world. You have no clue what's going on. The entire, unless you read about it previously, mm -hmm. the entire game world reveals itself to you through your actions. You have to forcibly explore the narrative. Yeah. And in most comics, it doesn't work that way. You know, you are, you know the route to explore the entire narrative. You just keep turning pages. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes it's about how creators can hide the things, and this is always a good idea, that reveal themselves on subsequent readings. You know, when you miss that thing the first time and it's a key to a part of the story, and, you know, while you don't want to go crazy with it and make it something that's obtuse, at the same time, it's like, you know, for a graphic novelist to have things that you want to read repeatedly, yeah. that's the difference between a checkout and a sale. It's, it's like... Um bah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say well, the time you... traveler in Gravity Falls. The time traveler <laughs> episode. You remember that one? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and like he he it, it, he's punished in the end of the episode by having to go back and fix all the things that they messed up throughout that episode, which were all things that tied into previous episodes. And they show all these cutscenes of him going back and fixing the things. And 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 then the question comes up: Was he really in the early episodes? And you go back and check the early episodes, and yes, yep. indeed, he's there. <laughs> uh, they planned that from the start, and and then so there was this. You know that uh, little burst of whatever in your brain that re that reward <laughs> chemical <laughs> went off. Think, yeah, yeah, and it yeah. all comes back to it's something extra. Yeah, you know, it's below the surface. It's something additional that encourages people to keep going. And you know, in games, it's like you know, especially like Pokemon as an example. There's so much text in any Pokemon game, and the kids want to get to every little last corner of it. Or even Animal Crossing, where it's like sometimes you want to make people move out of, move out of your town so that you can see what someone new has to say. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like exploring all the content that's in there takes work and skill and knowledge and development. And how can comic artists uh, get their players or their readers as invested in exploring everything their work has to offer when they don't have a mechanism by which it is revealed? Now, a great exception to that, and I'll talk about that when we get to our book recommendations, is Meanwhile by Jason Shiga. Oh, yeah. Which is, yeah. you know, that started as a web project. And then he made a, a, a paper version of it. And the best thing about it is because there's no page numbers, he came up with his own system of getting you from page to page. There's parts in that book. I mean, you could leaf through it, and you're like, how the hell do you get there? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's this one, and there's a point in the book that you can't get to from anywhere else. Oh, and wow. it's like a hidden Easter egg. And you're like, I've seen that leafing through, but there has to be a way to get there. But there isn't. There's no way to get to that page unless you step outside the system. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. So you have to hack it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what I love about that is, like, you see the Easter egg. Right. Easter egg reveals. It's right there. Yeah. But you still want to figure out how to get to the Easter egg. That is, that is sinister. Yeah. Sinister clever. Uh, clever. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about maps, uh, but I want to also talk about, before we get to that, I want to talk about any modern gaming experiences. And let's not, like, aside from nostalgia, what's happening now that you've played where you're like, they did it right. I... I'm participating in this thing. I'm consumed by this. Kerbal Space Program. Okay. Okay. Now, I've heard people talking a lot about that game. Oh, man. So. Now, here's the interesting thing about Kerbal. It has no narrative. None. There is no... Well, I guess the narrative is you, your Kerbals have a space program. <laughs> that is the entirety of the narrative. Okay? But... And now, it's, it's very much a sandbox. Now, there's now the career mode. They just launched the career mode. But career mode, there's still no goals. You know? It's like you have to earn science. You know, that's the resource you collect. It's called science. <laughs> and then you can use your science to unlock new technologies, right? <laughs> so, that is awesome. And then there's um, <laughs> the other thing is that Kerbals don't eat. They don't breathe. They don't uh, um, uh, relieve themselves. <laughs> so you can leave them in orbit for many, many, many years without needing anything. But there's then this hidden narrative in the game where if you're inside the cockpit and you zoom in, there's post-it notes. And one, there's this whole, like, hidden narrative about snacks, 
Like there's a note from Jebediah and it's like, sorry, I ate all the snacks. And then in one of the ships, there's a box that says snacks and another one says not snacks. And, you know, it's very light, very fun stuff. But I, have, I can't think of a game in years that has consumed me as much as Kerbal Space Program has consumed me. And you know why? Because I'm writing the narrative. Mm. I'm, you know, and it's not like, oh, my Kerbals are going to advance conquest. It's more like I'm trying to get to the planet closest to the sun. I miscalculated my fuel. Yeah, buddy, you're not coming home. <laughs> That's so tragic. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, a, and, but also I'm a part of a community. You know, we all wait so eagerly for the next release. And just to give, I mean, Kerbal just released point zero point two two. That's where they're at in their, in their development cycle. They're like two years away from 1.0. But on Reddit, on the forums, the whole mod scene, and everybody is getting into it. Like uh, somebody made a part that was called Protractor, okay? Because one of the big challenges is figuring what's the optimal time to leave their home planet to have a minimum fuel transfer to one of the outer planets, okay? You need to do some tricky math to do this, and you need to measure the phase angles between the, 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 the planets. And there's no mechanism to do this within the game other than holding a protractor up to the screen, <laughs> okay? Wow. So somebody made a part. They called it protractor. And the shape of the part looked like a TI-81 calculator that was duct taped to the outside of your hull. <laughs> and, you know, people are getting into this, and they're naming, like, one of the part packages I love a lot is called... Um, it's like Crazy Steve's Barbecue Parts and Rocketry Incorporated. <laughs> you know, so with just the most bare little phrases of how they name the parts, they've created this entire world and narrative that is entirely open to the players to modify the game entirely. And, you know, half their development team now are players who made mods that then got hired to be part of the development team. Oh, wow. So... I, I try not to talk about Kerbal anymore. I'm no, so. no. See, this is fascinating. This is this is like the the analog is you want people to make fan art or fan materials for your intellectual property, right? You want them to feel that they have uh, skin in that game and that they uh, when they make something, they're gonna want to share it, which is all gravy for you promoting your thing, right? I think the other thing is that, and, and I, this is how I say to my kids when I'm going to play, I say, okay, guys, you got to do something else. I'm going to go play with my Kerbals. <laughs> they're, they're my Kerbals. They're mine. <laughs> right. right. Right? And their fates are in my hands. And so I have a very deep personal connection to their tragic little lives. And if, like, if one of them blows up, I feel pain. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I am sad for them. And, and, and in a way, I mean... You know, I can't think of a media experience that I've had that, I mean, I certainly, you know, when I saw Gravity, it made me worry about my Kerbals. I didn't care about Sandra Bullock, you know? It's like, I'm just, man, my, my Kerbals really suffer up there, you know? It's so funny because, you know, they, it's like they have a name and they have two stats, courage and stupidity. Those are their two stats. And it's random and it doesn't even affect the game. So it's, just, it's great because it's like the player supplies all the narrative. Yeah. And I think that's really, I don't know if there's an equivalent of that in the comics world. Well, you it know? gets me wondering, I mean, like, just as a, as a theoretical idea, like, what would happen if you released your, st your ideas in c copyright free, right? Like, free of copyright, not Creative Commons even, just uh, copyright free so you get to participate in this world, you get to make your own stuff to go along with this world. Uh, the argument that I've heard in favor of that is you're the rare commodity in that picture. You're the only, not, not that you're the... Um, the only arbiter of canon, but you are the, the the source from which all of the interesting things that compel these people in the first place come from. They're going to keep coming back to you for that. I don't know. I don't know. I think that's well. I think there's the the the, the line between seed and riff. You know what I mean? Uh, one great example is when Penny Arcade's big uh, that wiki that they had, which was uh, the, the 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 epic legends of the hierarchs. They had a throwaway joke in one strip where they joked about an entire system of intellectual property that didn't actually exist. Uh, L. H. Franzibald's epic legends of the hierarchs, the Elementor saga, and it was basically <laughs> wizards who had furniture as their familiars. Okay. <laughs> And they made a reference to the wiki. Next thing, the wiki exists. I think there's now like 5,000 articles in the wiki referencing spin-off, cartoon versions, element store babies, you know, making yeah. fun of everything about pop culture yeah. and having so many. And, and it's basically they dropped this tiny little seed and their fans took it and ran. And, you know, that's part of the reason that they have such a successful business mm -hmm. is because their fans are a part of their community. Now, of course, we know they're not. Uh, outside of not knowing the right thing to do because they're still just a couple of guys and they don't always make the right decisions, right? Right, right. But 
there's no there's no uh, disputing the fact that they have built a successful business that few comic artists can will ever match. Mm-hmm. You know. Oh yeah, no, I'll, you, you can't dispute that. Uh, okay, let's talk about the maps thing because <laughs> <laughs> this actually ties into one of the, the the overall discussion in a way. I mean, because I I did a tweet when I was promoting the show where I said uh, like maps and books stink, but maps and games are awesome because uh, I was thinking of how a joke that gets bandied about about a lot is um, uh, whenever I open a book and there's a map on the inside front cover, I go, boo, front-loading your world-building on me. Let me just get to the story, right? This is clearly somebody who thinks they're Tolkien <laughs> and have overthought their world, and I don't need that. Just give me a story, which, oh, what does that really mean? But okay. And then I think about the stories that everybody talks about, the Nintendo Power Magazine, they had the Zelda fold-out, and right. the, you know, I, I just stared at that the way I stared at the uh, Sears Wish Book, right? And I wasn't even playing it. I was just looking at the map, right? And so it, it, it occurred to me that both of these things... Uh, because I've also heard from people about books, like, oh, I stare at the map because it gives me a sense of place in the story. But uh, it, it occurred to me that maps have different functions in the different things. And can we look at the functions of maps in games and say, what does that teach us about world building in our stories? So as not to make that guy, you know, the, the, that neckbeard or whatever, roll his eyes that, oh, a map, I don't want that. So, all right, so, why did I make you mad? <laughs> <laughs> so... so I- so, as I said when we were tweeting back and forth about this yesterday, uh, a, a map in a book, um, in a, it's particularly in a fantasy, um, is a signifier. It's saying you are going someplace else. Uh, this, is not the world you, this is not the world you know. This is not what you're doing. Uh, I don't even need to look at that map. I don't need to see what's on that map. I open a book up and see a map in there. I'm thinking, this is a fantasy. This, uh. is, this is some other world that, I, that I'm going to, that I'm going to be transformed into. Um, so that that I think is is an important function of a map in in a fantasy book or comic or or whatever it is you're, you're sort of doing is letting the reader know that they're not in Kansas anymore kind, yeah. kind of a deal. Uh, maps and games, of course, have a utilitarian function. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's how do I know where the heck I am? Um, and some is like I mentioned, Might and Magic Two, which I played on the Mac Plus way back in my college days and wasted way too much time on. And that was a game where you. S- uh, you sort of grew the map as you didn't know what was out there, but you would explore around, and the map would then, you know, show up. Oh, here's where the the evil wizard's keep is, or whatever it is like that. So now you know to go back to here, so you can get the key that you have to do to unlock the thing. You go in there and get your things, and then go, on, and then you can finally fight the wizard. But you didn't know where that wizard was, and the only way you could find your way back there was through the end game map, sort of sort of thing, um, or something like the Infocom games, right. where it was all text based um, adventure games. And you could buy books that like would have maps that would that let you know you have to go north and then west and then north and west <laughs> and sort of get around there. Um, so I, I'm 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 not as much of a student of video games to know if they serve as, as, as much of a signifier function as they would um, in a novel. Um, but I do know that they are much more utilitarian because I, I think you could read any fantasy novel and not look at that map right in there. And if and if the author's done their job. You're not having a hard time figuring out what what kingdom is north of the other kingdom or or whatever that sort of thing is. Yeah, um, it's it's not like you know the big Russian novels or not Russian novels, but things that want to be Russian novels mm-hmm. <laughs> that have they have like casts of three hundred characters or something right. like that, and you have to go to the to the character thing to say who was Captain Fujiwatz and you know right. that that sort of thing, or where was that kingdom again? You know, if that's yeah. what's going on, if you got to refer to the map to understand what's going on in the story, then I, then I think you've sort of uh, failed as a... Nobody ever fails as a storyteller. You, have, you, haven't, <laughs> <laughs> you, you haven't done your job as well as you could have um, a, as a storyteller. And uh, whereas, you know, map in a game, because you're navigating through that world in real time or, or something approximating real time, and you have to have some way of knowing where is that thing that I need to get to and how do I get there and what is in my way uh, of getting me there. Um, e- Eli, I don't know what you think about. I think that, that your 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 the utility is a really interesting angle because really in both cases, books and games, the map serves the same utility, which is to supplement a mental map your brain is building anyway. You know, and it's like the catch is in a game, frustration lies that way if you <laughs> if your mental map isn't good enough, and the the game map is there to help with that. Right? Nobody needs a mental map of World 1-1 from Super Mario Brothers. Right? <laughs> it only goes in one direction. Right? Right. But you, know, you think of any of the modern stuff, Call of Duty or any of that stuff, where, where all the levels are so overlapped. And it's like, but 
by the time you get good, you don't even need the map, right. except to tell you where the other players are, to provide you with additional information. <laughs> now, when you're reading a book, you're also making a mental map of those things, of how things correspond to each other, but it may not matter. And I think that that's really the big thing about when a book, a, a map at the beginning of a book is book versus when a map at the beginning of a book is like, oh, that's awesome, is do you need it? You know, and it's like, it's a, the signifier is an interesting part. It's like, you, like you said, you're not in Kansas anymore. But when I think about the maps in books that I've cherished, uh, one that comes to mind immediately is, is in Werner Vinge's uh, two books, uh, what's the, Deepness in the, no, not Deepness in the Sky, the first one, Fire Upon the Deep, and then uh, Children of the Sky which are about the, the, the zones of thought that uh, the, exist in the galaxy. And like the closer you get to the core, the slower you think. Mm. You know, the unthinking depths. There's like the, and it's just it's a major part of the story. And where a star or a system is in relationship to the zones of thought in the story is really important. So you need to be referring back to the map to kind of keep track of what the meaning of the story is. Or I think about uh, Julian May's uh, Metapsychic Trilogy. Have either of you guys read this? Uh -huh. So, you know, it's about basically the eruption of psychic powers on Earth. But it's also about a family. And the most useful thing in that book is it's a huge French-Canadian family because, of course, metapsychic powers, if they reveal themselves, will come from Montreal. <laughs> so if they... Uh, and you have this family tree which you keep referring to throughout the book because the author isn't expecting you to keep track of all the familial relationships in this family. They're saying, you need this aid to help you. Now, where it drove me crazy is in frickin' Middle Earth, okay? Because to me, there was nothing about the story that you needed to know what was where in relation to what to be able to know what was going on. These places were disconnected. They might as well be different game levels with a loading screen between them <laughs> because they're that disconnected. Now, but maybe my enmity to it is because my introduction to Lord of the Rings was actually a computer game, uh, yeah. Battle for Middle Earth for Apple IIGS. <laughs> and it came with an enormous cloth map. <laughs> and wow. I laid it out on a table next to the where the computer was. And I never needed to use it. Yeah. You know, and it's like... So, and of course, you know, my hobbits would always get killed by the Nazgul. They'd come out, you know, so it's like, <laughs> so I think that there's a big part of it is that does your world merit a map, you know? And if it's just a signifier, in many cases, the cover is the signifier, you know? It's like, oh, look at that. There's a planet coming out of the middle of the ocean. <laughs> That's some other world. Right. And it's, is your storytelling needing a visual aids to help the reader find their way? And are, is it being read? by people who want that. You know, I mean, there's definitely the audience that wants to get into a rich multi-layer world where they feel an achievement for understanding something that not an average reader could understand. Well, right? that, yep, that ties into the, the overall arc of what we're talking about here, right? Um, it's not a community till someone's excluded. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa. Is that true? Huh? It's true. Actually, the, the first warm fuzzy I ever got when I was building an online community around one of my comics, I had a forum, a PHPBB forum years ago, and somebody came in and made a new account, and they started using foul language in there. And I watched the leaders of this community, the people with a lot of high post count, go, hey, we don't talk like that here. Uh, and and like, they didn't say it on my behalf. They were like, Jersey doesn't like that. They just said, we don't talk like that here. I was like, whoa. Like, there's a culture here now. Norms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, is there any other... Uh, we, we didn't get, did we get any modern experiences? Or did you want to show some of the games I, I, you brought? I could do that or... I, I yeah, yeah. Because I also brought... This was another one that I wanted to talk about. Oh, Skylanders. Skylanders, where, man... Uh, this consumed my last December, and really? it, it, oh my gosh, one of the most evil, evil marketing machines I've ever seen. It was oh. made by Satan, but it's Satan dressed as you know, in a white suit and played by Mr. French. So how, uh, how, are we with the, how are we with the overhead camera here? Oh, I don't think we can use that oh, right now, okay. so you're going to have to hold it up. Hold it up to the camera here. The Quest for, the, for rings. the Rings for the Odyssey 2. And it's this, uh, somebody's cheering <laughs> in the other room over there. So Odyssey 2, if you remember, was the game system where the games had a handle on, cartridges had a handle on them. Um, and this, this box here, if you can kind of see in there. Packaging counts. Pack packaging, there's all these little little chits and, and things, and there's a map, and there's a map that came with this, which is why I, which is why I wanted to bring this. Um, here, I can hold it up while you talk about it. This is in gorgeous condition, holy smokes. So here Look is this. Here, you want, you want me to hold it up while you talk about it? I, I've never played this game, so I can't. I can't. Oh. Zombia? Repraria? 
Yeah. I just love the um, the production design that was done on, on this game. Yeah. Um, and there's this there's this little booklet here that I don't the know, Quest for the Rings. Quest for the Rings. Not yeah. to be confused with the Lord. No, 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 uh, no. Any any confusion you make is surely to the benefit of right. the company that put it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look at look at this packaging. How elaborate it is for just this cartridge. Where this is where the action's happening, right? Right. Right. But uh, it's 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 almost like an Apple experience unboxing this thing. Oh yeah, this this game was undoubtedly ahead of its time in the, as far as packaging and, and stuff. Goes. And I mean, well, and, and you think about the Infocom games also had very crazy packaging. Right, you yeah. know, like the Hitchhiker's Guide came with the uh, peril sensitive sunglasses, <laughs> right. which was just a black piece of cardboard that went over your eyes. And the fluff. The fluff. That's <laughs> yes. right. The fluff. <laughs> the pocket fluff. <laughs> Little things like that go a long way, though, man. Like when you feel like you're part of the experience, or like even in a silly way like that. Zonox. Zonox. Oh, so, man, so, I so have here those. is. You, well, do I see the name Chuck Norris on you that? Do. <laughs> so th this is one of their, the the double ender games for the Atari 2600, where it's two games in one one thing. You'd plug it in that way or plug it in that way. So you could either have um, Zonox or Chuck Norris Super Kicks. <laughs> <laughs> Guess which one was the A side of that cartridge? <laughs> Chuck Norris Super Kicks. Super Kicks. I remember that very well. Uh, oh, that's the greatest name for a game I've ever heard. <laughs> it doesn't deliver what it promises. <laughs> Super Kicks. You bet it does. <laughs> and Chuck Norris in in four bit glory or whatever. Oh my gosh, that's so great. Um, so I brought this. Um, Turbo Graphic 16 was the system that oh, few, people, few people heard of, but it advertised in the back of every comic in the world in 1991, and nobody had one. And nobody had one. No, no. But the but the game was it wasn't a cartridge. It was a it was a oh weird. It was a data card that you would slide into the, to the system. Looks like a memory card. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Final lap. And like its big deal was it was 16 bit, right? It was 16 bit before Super Nintendo and Sega. It was pretty close to Genesis, right? It was yeah, yeah. it was about Coke. Coincident with Genesis, but they had their CD drive on the market before Sega CD did, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what 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 killed Turbo Graphics sixteen? Obscurity, I think. Yeah, yeah. Too, Just too, no brand too, awareness. Too expensive. Yeah. Um, at the, you'll see so often in the video game market that the first to market with the technology fails because it's too expensive and not enough. So not enough people are into it. Not enough games are developed for it. They never get that must-have game developed for it. And then the c company that comes by second with that. With that technology, when it's a little cheaper, yeah. so like that, and they don't have the shame of failure over their over their system, yeah. is able to take advantage of it. So, like the first, your first CD-based games, just didn't just did not yeah. just did not pan out because the technology was too expensive. Um, we got to get the book recommendations in oh, a yeah. minute here because yeah, we're running low on time. But th this is the kind of thing you can go to the CVGA at uh, the University of Michigan at the Deerstadt Center and you can play Chuck Norris Super Kicks. Uh, I think I'm going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> i got to check the game out. It's amazing. All right. So any final thoughts on this whole game discussion thing before we kick over to book recommendations real fast? I think that part of the message for comic creators is that part of the reason that games are such a huge industry right now is because of the communities that form around them. And that, you know, while so many creators really want to get back to the experience of being a creator in the 70s and 80s, where you released your fully formed thing out onto the world and it did well or it didn't, um, I think that that era of media of all types is, is decreasing rapidly. And that the opportunity is there for you to give as compelling, immersive, and community building of an experience in a comic as you can in a game. And really, Again, you know, I'm in no way defending them, but that's how the Penny Arcade guys became millionaires with the shitty three-panel comic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, did, did you ever see that uh, Penny Arcade strip generator that got passed around the internet recently? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that just goes to show, like, there was more to it than just the comic. That's right. Uh, uh, it has to be. Okay, so, Dave? Any, any final thoughts? Or do you want to just kick into book recommendations? Let's go into some book recommendations. <laughs> All right. So let's hear from the librarian first. All right, so, so I brought a couple things. Um, Comics, comics that use video games, or, or the, the actually the experience of playing video games, as opposed to there are plenty of comics in there like based on video game. Where you got your Sonics, you got your Mass Effect comics, your Halo comics, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I didn't want to bring any of those because you know they exist and, and, and they're out there. Yeah. Um, uh, the, these are two comics that I brought. Um, this first one here is is uh to the camera. Uh, <laughs> you got that Para Para, Para by a Andy Cito, which was published by a now defunct. Um, uh, 
outfit called Comics One. Um, Andy Cito is a Hong Kong based um, creator. And um, this book is a, it's sort of a Romeo and Juliet story uh, set against the backdrop of, of a dance video game called Para Para, which is Para very Para Paradise. Isn't that the name of the game? Para yeah, Para yeah. Paradise? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that was a real game. They have it at Pinball Pete's. Oh, <laughs> another Ann Arbor establishment people should come out for. Hold that up there. Um, and um, I, I'm not saying this is a good comic necessarily, yeah. but it's a very interesting uh, comic. Uh, I must win. win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. Um, and um, he, he does a decent job of, of um, getting the dynamicism of dance without the typical comic tropes that are involved in, you know, putting squiggly lines and, and stuff around. It opens up with this musical number. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> awesome. It's one of two comics, the other one being Grant Morrison and, and um, Bond. Crap, what's his first name? Mm. Uh, Bond. <laughs> anyway, uh, their banana, banana Rama also opens with the, with the Bollywood dan dance number. Uh, but this is I just, then they're like they're like this whole big crew of stuff like dancing at the opening of this game and and I dance because of her. <laughs> <laughs> it's very over very over melodramatic, melodramatic and yeah. over dramatic. Um, completely a 180 from that is issue number two of Kevin Huizenga's uh, Ganges uh, from Fantagraphics. I'll hold it up there. And the comic is in two parts. The first part of this. He's sort of representing um, a video game, a strange sort of a fighting video game with these alien um, characters. And he do never explains the game, never tells you what the heck's going on. Um, but he's able to, within the panels of this comic, um, give you a feeling of a, of a game that you've never played before, that you've never seen, but you're recognizing it. Because he's using the tropes of video games. And he's sort of got the, the life, bar, life meters and, uh, and all that kind of stuff down there. And because he's like the most awesome, incredible artist, it's, you know the game sort of blows up and stuff like that. Um, and then the second part of this is a much different story. Um, and it's it's uh, Glenn Ganges is Kevin Huizenga's everyman character. It's a thinly disguised version of himself, basically. And he tells the story of in the waning days of an internet startup back back in the um, around circa 2000 when the whole bubble was was bursting. And as all these uh, uh, programmers and, and other folks who are working at this uh, internet startup company well it's failing and mm -hmm. they know it's failing and people every week somebody else is getting fired and somebody else is getting let go um, and the um, the uh, uh, workers at this company start playing this game this first this uh, I don't know if it's the first it's a third person shooter game no, it's a first person shooter game it's a shooter game <laughs> <laughs> where they're where they're going around and of course they start first start playing it during their off hours and then as the company just doesn't have work for them they're playing it during during thing and so um he's sort of um, as the game as people are playing the game and of course people drop out because they're no longer working for the company and it's um and it's really fascinating look at um game at how people use a game to create a community uh, when the community around them is fa is failing out, out there, um, this is one of this is one of my favorite comics from the last ten years, um, and um, I wow. fan, I think it's still in print. I know we've got a copy at our library uh, because it's the sort of thing that we <laughs> that we have at our library. Uh, Para Para, um, you can go on Amazon and like new for a one cent plus <laughs> plus, <laughs> plus shipping. shipping. So you know <laughs> four bucks or something like that. Uh, you'll be able to find a, a a newer used copy of that, even though. Uh, the publisher's long out of long out of print. So those are the two things I brought along to show. And I know I see that Eli has brought some awesome stuff. So yeah. <laughs> so I brought a couple things that are only kind of tangentially related, but it's just kind of what I've been reading l lately. And if you haven't read Castle Waiting, mm -hmm. uh, Castle Waiting, also published by Fantagraphics, um, this is just fantastic stuff. There's two volumes. Um, what's her name? Linda. Linda Bentley. Linda yeah. Bentley. Yeah. And the art is outstanding, but it's mostly it is a very deep, multi-layered story, and it's kind of like, you know, as comics and movies and everything is kind of thinking about the Bechdel test and about uh, it as three white guys sit around and talk about <laughs> comics. Um, <laughs> as we're talking about that, this is one of the most kind of astonishingly, astonishingly and refreshingly pieces of feminist comic that is not in any way, shape, or form about feminism that I've ever read. It's just, it's just about women, you know? And it's like, oh my God, that's so refreshing. That's so sad that it's so refreshing, yeah. you know? And it's like, but it doesn't talk about feminism. 
You know what I mean? So is there like yeah. an antecedent of the of the Bechdel test where it's women talking but they can't talk about feminism? You know, it's, it's something silly like that. But so it's, the medley test. The medley test. Yes, yes. So it's super, super great. I love it very much. It's just a great story. But it's also a story in which basically nothing happens. You know, it's like there. It, the the narrative is mostly just the people who live in the castle talking to each right. other. It's kind of the background characters of all the fairy tales. Yeah, and and they're and so they're hanging out and having their own lives, and you're sort of peeking into the lives of of the of the maids in waiting and all, all those other, who, who will come on for like one scene to deliver uh, the important bit of plot. <laughs> so so people who like Downton Abbey or uh, the Paradise might except there's not intrigue. You know okay. what I mean? It's like it's just they're tell they're talking about things that happen in their life. They're telling stories. At one point, there's a flashback that's four layers deep, if yeah. I remember right. So you know, <laughs> so it's it's and it's just great. Stuff. And it's not as boring as it sounds. No, it's it really, really isn't. fascinating. You love so. reading it. You really care about the characters. Well, it's that's that's stuff. the thing. When you write really good characters, you don't need as much intrigue because you just right. care about what happens. Well, so, to the you know, it's like Seinfeld. You know, it's like yeah. you just want to see them talk about stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, actually. So then I brought from. I am a such a huge fan of nonfiction graphic novels. This is the cartoon introduction to economics. This is volume one, microeconomics. Volume two is macroeconomics. It has a very sort of. Um, I used a particular paint program kind of look to it. Yeah. Um, but it's got a cool style, and it does a great job of explaining really complex uh, economic challenges and problems and situations. It has certainly informed the way I think about a lot of the stuff that we worry about at libraries, trying to determine what of our decisions are Pareto efficient and other sorts of deep economic terms. So that's just a fantastic thing. I also, um, I just read Terminal City. I don't know if you guys have read Terminal yeah. City. Uh, is unbelievably awesome. I would just recommend that. But then I wanted to bring this to be or not to be, yeah. Ryan North. Yeah. Okay, so this isn't a graphic novel exactly. It has lots of art in it, lots of art by Kate Beaton, uh, art by other people. And it's basically, this is Hamlet turned into the most awesome choose your own adventure ever. Yeah. And I don't remember backing this Kickstarter, but it showed up in my office, <laughs> perhaps for this reason, to get onto the show. But just in looking through this, he's done a gorgeous job of putting together the story in, you know, and it's not like they're not texting each other. You know, it's not like that kind of modernization. It's like he makes the language more modern. He makes the characters more modern. And the very best thing is if you turn past the first page, you know, it says here it is. Okay, turn to page four to choose your character. But if you keep turning, there's a picture of disapproving Keanu, <laughs> and it says, the end. And it's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Did you not read the instructions? You must be, whoa, 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 slow down there, cowboy. This book is crazy insane. How are you even acting like this is an ordinary book? So your final score is maybe learn to read books better sometime out of a 1,000. <laughs> so that's super great. Of course, Ryan North is, is definitely a genius that we're... We're all uh, fortunate to live among <laughs> at this point. So I would highly recommend to be or not to be, uh, whether you're a fan of the Bard or not. Uh, highly recommend. A lot of really great cartoonists are in that book as well. So even if you're just a fan of pretty art, uh, it's worth looking at for that. So, okay, well, thank you for the great book recommendations, guys. Um, anything going on that you want to give a shout-out for at either library? Yes, so this Saturday um, we are... In part, doing a joint event. Yes. And what? It's yes. A, so Saturday is Game at Your Library Day, um, throughout throughout the country, perhaps throughout the world. Yeah. A few um, international. You will places. be able to go to your library and participate in a Smash uh, Brothers tournament, yep. as well as other activities. Uh, it also just happens to coincide with the fifth anniversary party of the CVGA, so we will have cupcakes. And um, gaming, and uh, we're calling it an open house, but every day is an open house. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I will, so I'll be there, um, and um, uh, I'm not usually there on Saturday. Uh, I'm hardly ever in the archive. Oh my! <laughs> 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 I don't have time to play all these ga awesome games that we well, have. Well, well, you're accessioning new games all the time. Yeah. I've seen your office. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, but yeah, there'll be a um, a uh, Smash Brothers tournament. And Eli, you want to talk about what you're doing here? Yeah, well, we, you know, so we've been organizing for about this is the fifth year that we've organized a national Smash Brothers tournament where we get usually is about forty libraries around the country playing against each other online in real time, and it is a really complex and fun event. And this year, because CVGA is going to be involved, we'll finally be able to settle 
the important question of who's better at Smash Brothers, <laughs> university students <laughs> or townies? <laughs> and I believe the townies <laughs> will reign triumphant because we have built an enduring community as opposed to the more ephemeral community of, of the campus. Oh. So we will see about that. Them's fighting words. Yeah, them's fighting. Oh, Almost we, literally. <laughs> we need a mean Gene Okerlund in here to, <laughs> to moderate this discussion. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. <laughs> yeah. At the new so, stats, stats, so, stats, stats, stats. So where, where should we go to find information about these events? AADL.org and or? And or? Um, lib.umich.edu. Lib. 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 Um, there should be a link there probably on the front page by now because it's an event coming up pretty soon. Uh, so... So very cool. So people should just, if you're in Ann Arbor, you should stop by AADL or uh, the, the Duderstadt or both. And if your library isn't participating in this event, yeah. go ask them why and yeah. tell them that next year they should. Because I have not ever seen something. Well, first of all, I'm not aware of something else that so many libraries do together at the same time. It's a very uncommon thing. It is really cool. The other part of it is it turns the kid who won the tournament in the room and everyone's kind of upset about him into the local champion defending your library's honor against those jerks down the street. <laughs> so it really is an extremely powerful community-building thing. And, you know, we have had tiny libraries of towns of 300 people get to the final round of the tournament, and it was in their newspaper, you know? That's and it's cool. like a very powerful uniting event for their town that they beat the jerks at Phoenix Public Library, you know? <laughs> and they made it to the final round where they have to face us. You know, so it's... <laughs> It's great stuff. So yeah, it's it's like the Karate Kid movie, right? Or Rudy, or any of those movies where like some some youngster gets to be a champion for That's his. Right. Yeah, and, and Only this one's true. <laughs> 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 And there's even beyond that, there's a lot of amazing stuff at ADL that I don't shout out about enough. Besides the Lego contest, there's also a music collection, music music objects that you can check out. Yep, we call them music tools. Music tools, uh, like like uh, uh, a theremin. Theremin, you yep. have a theremin for. You guys got a theremin? Yes, circulating theremin. Oh. <laughs> I know, we right? We have something you might be interested in, Dave, called a pianocade, <laughs> which has arcade buttons and an arcade joystick, and then it has uh, a 6502 music chip. That is controlled by. So it's a synthesizer that's like an arcade controller board. Oh dear! Yeah. <laughs> Stop by on your way out. And then, and so, then, so can I have the theremin transferred to Mallet Creek for me to, to pick absolutely. up? Absolutely. Well, except, no, except you can't request them. You have to get lucky. Uh, uh, okay. And then there's there's a, a telescope collection which uh, comes with an instruction manual drawn by this kid here, yeah. uh, and then a microscope collection that you can check out so you can uh, do science. You can get you can achieve more science through your library as well. Uh, and the Kids Read Comics event happens here every year now, too. So you guys are doing some pretty cool stuff. Uh, there's no wonder you're getting that five-star well, ranking so we're, in the we're, library journal. We're thankful for uh, patrons like you, Jersey, who come uh, and bring us great things that we can do. Oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. So. <laughs> 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 all right, Eli, where can people find more about you? Uh, just AADL.org. Okay. You know, it's all that stuff. I'm Ulotricus on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That means curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be linked in the show notes. And Dave? Uh, Dave Reads Comics on Twitter, and the CVGA is UMCVGA on Twitter. UMCVGA on Twitter. All right, thank you guys for this awesome discussion. That was so much fun. And thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. This episode will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG88. That's where you can find the video and the audio for the show. If you enjoyed it, I would uh, love it if you gave us a thumbs up on YouTube, if you're using YouTube, or if, uh, go to iTunes and give us a star review. You don't have to write a review, just however many stars you think this deserves. And then there's a, a part one of this discussion where I actually talk with a game designer on this topic is at leanintoart.com, which I will link to in the show notes. Episode 87, I've talked to the game designer about fun loops and about the design of games and what storytellers can learn from that. So until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Droz of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. Oh, cool.